All righty. And that just brings us to some housekeeping for today's training. Um, so for our basic Zoom housekeeping, please keep your microphones on mute. Um, while we're going through the slides, there will be opportunities for us to have conversations. We'll do some small breakout rooms um, and be able to um, speak with each other. So for now, just asking you to go ahead and keep yourself on mute and we'll let you know when it's a good time to unmute. If it's possible, if it's safe and comfortable for you to do so, again, we'd love to have um, you turn your cameras on as we continue throughout the day. It helps us gauge if this is working or not. Um, also, I love looking at myself and my colleagues, but we'll love to also look at the new faces that are in the room. Um, if you have any questions, please put them into the chat. Feel free to put it into the chat so everyone can see it. If you have something a little bit more personal or you just want a one-on-one -on -one answer, please feel free to privately message me um, with your question or Jenny and um, anyone from the Too Small to Fail team or um, Jenny from Read by Fourth, we're happy to field those questions in the chat. And again, as a reminder, this training um, is being recorded for any colleagues, friends, or family that are interested in um, viewing this training later. It will be available online on a private link for them to view. So don't worry, we will um, share this training and it is being recorded today. Just so folks know some objectives today, um, what you're getting into. We're going to learn about the Multiple Spaces Pilot Project here in Philadelphia. Again, I know those words may not make sense, but they will by the end of this, I promise, I hope. Uh, we're also going to um, understand the state of literacy here in Philadelphia as it is today. That'll be presented by Jenny and the Read by Fourth team. We're going to understand why it's important to build relationships and connect with families. And then lastly, um, we're gonna learn some tools and strategies to help parents understand the importance of building their child's early brain and language development. So really just um, gathering some tools and strategies um, for you while you're in your workspaces. So really excited to do this um, together today. Very briefly, as an introduction to Too Small to Fail, um, these are our goals at Too Small to Fail. It's to increase awareness and spark positive change in parents and communities to boost early brain and language development in children ages zero to five years old. So we're really looking like well before kindergarten um, from the moment of birth until they're five, year, um, five years old. Um, how can we help to boost um, positive change and especially in early um, brain and language development for parents and children? Um, we want to make uh, the small moments big. We want to make those times where they're in a waiting room and they're just waiting to receive services or they're at a laundromat. If they're waiting at the pediatrician's office, we want to make those small, small moments big for them and for communities to empower people in places to make these moments happen more. So this is where we're working together with you um, in the communities where our um, children and families are. In terms of multiple spaces, again, I, I've said it a couple of times, those words may not make sense, but here's what um, the Multiple Spaces Project is in Philadelphia. We are looking to transform everyday spaces into learning rich environments. So we're looking to transform waiting areas across Philadelphia into learning rich environments. Um, and what I mean by that is that we're meeting caregivers and children where they are. We want to make sure that if there are families and caregivers and young children who are waiting at a social services um, center um, to meet with their caseworker, or if they're at a health center and they're waiting to do their pediatrician appointment, that there are things in those waiting spaces that are enriching for both um, the caregiver and the children. Things like um, access to books, um, learning toys, and things like that. We want to cr create and foster learning rich environments throughout the city of Philadelphia. Currently, we are partnered with three city agencies. The city agencies are the Philadelphia Office of Homeless Services, the Department of Human Services, and the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. Through these partnerships, we have been able to identify three treatment site locations. So those are three locations where we will be providing um, space transformations to create these learning rich environments in waiting areas across the city. 
So for the folks who are here, those are likely your places. So we're looking at health center number six on Girard Avenue. We're looking at Axe um, Services up in North Philly on the other side of Broad Street. And then we're also looking at what was formerly known as, um, excuse me, United Communities of Southeast um, Philadelphia, but is now the Greater Philadelphia Community Alliance. If you're from GPCA, please let me know if I got that wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's the new name. I learned it on Monday. Um, and so those are our three sites currently, and we're hoping to add a fourth one. This is a pilot project, so it's just something that we're trying out. This is an idea that the Too Small to Fail team has developed alongside the city agency partners and with the William Penn Foundation with a goal of being able to create these um, moments and spaces um, for learning and for fun learning to happen um, across the city. So this is something that we're implementing from, um, we've started, we started in the summer with monthly meetings with our partners and we're continuing through December of this year. We wanna see how these transformations happen, what happens in these transformations, the impact it may or may not have on families, um, our intention is that we want positive impact, but we, what we're going to do is we're going to do these transformations and we're just going to let things happen naturally and see what will happen. We're hoping that um, with the impact that it'll be positive and that it's something that we might be able to implement in other parts of the city, as well as in different cities and other communities statewide and nationwide. So this is really so the first time we're partnering with city agencies in at this capacity, and we're really interested in seeing what changes and what kind of positive impact we can have. And then that leads me, I'm gonna pass the ball to Jenny um, to talk to us about um, Philadelphia's early literacy ecosystem. Did it again. I was on mute. Thank you, Lanika. Um, you'd think two years in, we would all know how to unmute ourselves in, in a timely fashion. Um, I just want to set some ground rules for, for me presenting these slides. I am used to being in very informal settings. I know we're all spread across the city here and on our little cameras, but please don't hesitate to just break in and say, hey, Jenny, I have a question or what? tell me more about that. It's totally fine. If you feel more comfortable putting your questions in chat, that's also okay. But um, I'm going to ask Lanika to watch the chat because I am terrible at watching the chat and presenting at the same time. So Lanika, if there's a timely question, you get to be the one to break in and tell me. All right. So uh, that you can move on to the next slide. So as Lanika was talking about and Patty was talking about, we know uh, that building the brain in those first five years of life is critical. And for us at Read by Fourth, it's a critical ingredient into making sure children are able to be proficient readers by the time they complete third grade. The Read by Fourth vision and mission is around that, around protecting every child's right to read and making sure they enter fourth grade on grade level with their reading. And that's important for a number of reasons. I think we'd all on this Zoom agree that the skill of reading and literacy is important skill for uh, adults to be able to take part in, in our society in a way that they want to, in a way that creates family sustaining wages and their jobs. But it really starts with grade level reading, right? And so we're gonna talk about what that is and how we get there and how this project fits into that. And I want you all to walk away from this portion, understanding how your role in this project is part of a larger movement in Philadelphia around supporting grade level reading. The last thing I'll say here is just that grade level reading um, is that is critical by fourth grade because if you're not familiar with how education works in the school system, starting in fourth grade, teachers spend less time teaching the skill of reading and they assume kids now have the basic reading skills and reading class is now about practicing reading and children are expected to use reading to access other content. So if children aren't on grade level when they enter fourth grade, they not only fall behind in reading, they start to fall behind in science, in math, in history, in all their subjects, because taking part in any of those classes requires a certain reading skill level. And so it becomes a snowball and um, exponential impact 
over time. And children who are not reading on grade level and in as they enter fourth grade are something like four to six times less likely to graduate high school on time, which is a marker for people not moving on to a post-secondary credential, which is a marker for not ultimately being able to take part in the workforce the way we, we hope people will. So it's an important early benchmark. Keep going. However, here in Philadelphia and nationally, many of our children are, are not meeting that benchmark. This statistic is a Philadelphia statistic, statistic excuse me, that's several years old now. Uh, it's about 60% of Philly's children are not reading on grade level. We actually don't have an updated statistic because of the pandemic. So for the last two years, uh, we haven't been able to administer the PSSA in what I would call a normal way. One year we didn't administer it at all, and the next year only some students took it. So we, we don't know really if it's 60% still better or worse. We assume it's worse, if anything. But that means like nearly two thirds or more of our children are not hitting that benchmark that we need them to hit. If you go on, Monica. And that's why Read by Fourth was created. So we are Philly's early literacy movement. We are not an organization. We are a coalition of partners that have been working together for the past seven years. We're also part of a national coalition on grade level reading organized by the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Locally, we are about 150 different organizations. Uh, and if your organizations aren't yet part of our campaign, you're welcome to join us. It's an easy process. Just basically let me know you wanna join. But it's all sorts of organizations, small and large, city government, the school district, grassroots organizations. There's also more than 500 individuals that we call reading captains that are volunteers in the campaign. And there are more than 350 community activists. Now those are folks that, or organizations that haven't quite joined the campaign as a formal partner, but are somehow supporting the outcomes of the campaign. This might be a laundromat that puts a book nook in a corner of their laundromat or um, a doctor's office that is helping give out books, all sorts of ways to be one of our community activists. So how are we trying to influence grade level reading? Well, we have a theory of change that really speaks to what I'll call the three pillars of us meeting that, that vision. And those are families, communities, and systems. So in this little graphic I have for you, you can imagine that icon in the middle, this parent reading to a child is our happy outcome. And for that to happen, we need systems that are organized and implemented in just and equitable ways. We need families that are empowered to do their part. And we need communities that are full of learning landscapes. Sometimes we say literacy rich, but just have opportunities everywhere people turn to help support learning. And that's really what this project is all about. Read by Fourth really tries to make those things happen through a combination of capacity building with our partners, through partnerships and convenings, sharing research, tracking data, and a lot of communications and storytelling. If you haven't seen us on social media, I encourage you to follow Read by Fourth on your favorite social media channel, and you'll hear some of these stories and get engaged in the conversation. And if you're a SEPTA writer, perhaps you've seen the, the latest campaign, Come Aboard the Reading Promise, which is another way to do what this project is doing uh, around multiple spaces, which is really engage adults and children in playful learning conversations in their everyday life. But check out the Broad Street Line or the uh, Tasker Morris or Erie Station or several buses that you might see will have these messages. You can go on, Monica. So let's talk about how children actually learn to read. And I like to say that teaching reading is actually a rocket science. You know, to be a quality reading teacher in the K through three system is a science and it, it, there's a lot of skill that goes into it. But there's roles that all of us can play that don't take a PhD in rocket science. And so it's really about understanding this pathway from birth to fourth grade and learning the role you can play. So let's think about this. Let's think about the stages of a child's life from birth to, to grade three or age eight, more or less. The first three years, we're really focused on the brain development. That's when the brain develops the most for humans other than those teenage years. 
And this is our moment to just instill all sorts of information and knowledge, vocabulary in a child. Ages four to five are when we start to do the building blocks of school readiness and all the skills a child will need to actually participate in school from writing their name and recognizing letters and having an understanding of phonemics, which is the sounds uh, letters make. And then in fifth through eighth grade, or excuse me, <laughs> age five through eight, kindergarten through third grade, we're looking at a child's attendance record, we're looking at the quality of the teaching, and we're looking at what happens outside of school. Are there books in homes? Are there literacy-rich communities? Are there after-school programs that are reinforcing the learning that a child is getting during the school day? There's all sorts of research that looks at all of these five ingredients to raising readers and the correlation between those and the outcome of grade level reading. So I'm just going to break down two of the basic skills that you will recognize this the minute I lay it out for you. But if you haven't stopped to think about it, it's helpful to stop to think about it. The skill of being a proficient reader really is the combination of two skills that work together. One we call decoding. And that's the, 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 the classic cat makes cat, right? The, the letters build together to create a word. And we've all done that. We've all sounded out words with children and ourselves. That's decoding. Second skill though, is around language comprehension or meaning. And that is understanding that when you hear the word cat, when you read the word cat, when you put those letters together, you actually know what a cat is, right? Um, that might be an obvious one because most humans by age five know what a cat is. But let's say you're um, looking at a, the word pond and you're trying to help a first grader sound out the word pond and they still know those letters, but they've never left their neighborhood in North Philadelphia and have never seen a pond or had the read a story about a pond. They don't know what a pond is or the difference between a pond or a lake and an ocean. So that language comprehension is also a key, key ingredient to not just reading the words, but understanding what you're reading. So Read by Forth and its partners over the years have looked at all those ingredients from the brain development and attendance and out of school time and instruction. They've looked at this theory of change of families and communities and systems, and they came up with a, um, communications framework for families that we call the reading promises. And this is because we realized there was really about a hundred different things we were trying to tell families and communities they needed to be doing if we wanted to meet our goal of raising readers. And we needed to simplify that into things that people could remember. We also wanted it to be less preachy. You know, people have often heard the read with your child 20 minutes a day, or make sure you have books in your home, or get your kid to work to school every day. We really didn't want it to be uh, an expert telling a family what to do. We wanted to be families talking with families about what works for them, what they are happy about, what they've celebrated in their own lives, and how can we be in community together in raising children. So you'll notice in the language of the reading promises that it's really very asset-based, trauma-informed, and really parent-to-parent -parent conversations but they cover those ingredients that I already spoke about. So the first one is really about making sure you're spending time reading with your child in a way that builds background knowledge, that makes reading fun and builds a habit of reading. So we, help, we have people remember the ABCs, you know, stop and ask questions and build vocabulary and connect that story to your child's life. Talk it up, take turns, tune in, is really about conversations in everyday spaces. While you're cooking, while you're in a laundromat, while you're at a health office appointment, how can you have conversations? How can you ask questions? How can you tune into your child and build that, build that brain and background knowledge? Championing your school success is about partnering with, with your child's school. It's about attendance, about understanding what it takes to learn to read and having meaningful conversations with your child's teacher. Create With You is about celebrating cooking and family history and family traditions and all the playful things you can do with a child that also builds the, the foundations of reading. 
And the protect your right to read is our message around the social justice aspect of this campaign and all that we can be doing to fight for fair funding for our schools, for making sure our schools are safe places, for um, making sure families have choices, all the things we need to do to protect a child's right to read. So just to recap, all of those promises really rely on families, communities, and systems. And all of you on this call are part of all three of those pillars of our work. Maybe you represent a system, the health system. Maybe you represent a community. You may be a parent. If you're not a parent, you're part of a family with young children in some way, or you're in a community with young children. And so we all have to think about the roles we can play. So how are we in Philadelphia? How are all those partners actually supporting reading? Let's run through this a little bit faster. So as I said, families are the children's first teacher. And actually, we just updated this slide to say families and the communities in which they live are children's first teachers. Keep going. So with our families, we have worked to distribute more than 2 million books over the past seven years. We have done a lot of work with Susan Newman, who's on this call today, I see as well, to really understand book distribution, what makes giving books to families valuable. It's not just handing the book to a family, but the programming that goes along with it. And the importance of having books that are mirrors of a child's life and not just windows on another world. And so a lot of what Read by Fourth is doing right now with our partners is trying to increase access to diverse books and diversify where books are being distributed so we can get to communities where there has been less book distribution to date. We are also working to create kind of family giveaways and things that can bring those promises to life and build on those ingredients of early literacy. You see our, our alphabet poster that we created this past fall that has all the letters to help families teach their children the letters of the alphabet in Philadelphia friendly ways. So if you zoom in on there, you'll see that P is for pretzel and uh, M is for the mummers and things that are very Philly specific. We have a parent council that helps to collect parent voice and is in conversation with parents and communities about strategies of the campaign. And then we move on to our community part of the work. We have to date worked with partners to create more than 1200 installations and you all are going to be part of this work and grow that number even further. The latest one is the one I talked about on the SEPTA stations and on the buses. And we've done some in grocery stores as well and uh, Smith Playground and in bodegas. We've also been working to expand the number of sidewalk libraries throughout the city and again to diversify where those are because they tend right now to be in more affluent communities and we want to spread those around. And we have the Reading Captains Initiative. I mentioned the 500 volunteers that are out in our communities. This is growing every day. We're always looking for more Reading Captains. This uh, initiative is built on the concept of the block captain in Philadelphia. Our vision is to have a Reading Captain on every block of the city. That is someone who can share the information like we're sharing with you today to the friends and neighbors on their block to help raise readers. We also hold events all the time. Our largest event is the Reading Promise Week, which happens in October. And we also encourage you to think about joining us for Reading Promise Week. It's a week long festival in which communities and families and reading captains and organizations plan events that engage families and communities in any aspect of that journey of learning to read, whether it be a parent training or a, a sidewalk poetry contest or a sight word scavenger hunt, whatever it might be. Philadelphia, whether you know it or not, um, you'll know it now, is home to some of the, uh, the most Black-owned bookstores that we are aware of. We, we believe that it's the city with the most Black-owned bookstores per capita of any major city in the United States. Um, you can go on our website and learn about them, but that is part of our campaign and really celebrating the diversity of literacy and voices in our community. 
And as I said before, we really, really, truly believe that reading is a right, that it is the access point to a meaningful and productive life. And so we want everyone to be part of this campaign and we'd like everyone to find their space in the campaign. Um, but the last part of it is really about systems and how we advocate for those systems to be fairly resourced and equitably designed. And we're going about that through advocating for fair funding for our libraries, which right now aren't even open five days a week. We need to get to that point. We're also trying to expand the number of quality pre-K seats for children aged three to four. The PHL pre-K program is part of that, but it's also about capacity building of existing pre-K programs to bring them up to a STARS level that would equal quality and to make sure the price point is something that families can afford and that they feel like there's choices in their communities. We are working to uh, improve the way reading is taught. There is a whole body of work now called the science of reading, which really speaks to that rocket science of teaching reading that I mentioned earlier. Many of our schools have really adjusted how they're teaching reading to align to the science of reading, but not all of our teacher preparation programs have made that same switch. So a lot of what Read by Fourth is doing right now with local schools of education is helping them make the switch so that the teachers that are coming out of their teacher prep programs are actually prepared to teach reading in the way the schools need them to be teaching. Currently, there's a little bit of a mismatch. There's a large mismatch nationally. Locally, we've made a fair amount of progress around this, but we need to make more. But as I said, everyone and their mother and brother and sister has a role to play. This is one of my favorite laundromats in North Philadelphia. This is Jazz the Barber. He takes his role very seriously. He reads with children while they're getting haircuts. It's fantastic, but we want everyone to find your role. We want you to think about what yours is. And I know Lonica and her team is gonna help you learn just that. For more information, please go to our website, readbyforth.org. You can also go to readingpromise.org, which is where you'll find that playlist. The readingpromise.org website is really a family-facing website, and Read by Fourth is the one built for you and for partners of the campaign. Thank you, Lonica. Thank you, Jenny. And that brings us into our trusted messenger portion of this training. So we're just gonna shift gears a little bit. I'm back <laughs> um, and I'll be walking us through some of this um, information that we have from Too Small to Fail. So just transitioning us into a little bit more interaction here um, and just wanna do a short exercise with folks. So um, if you want to just like wiggle out your fingers a little bit, um, get into your body and let's think about someone you trust. So just think about, it could be anyone, and you don't have to say it out loud right now, but just for yourself, think about someone that you trust and then ask yourself, what makes them trustworthy? What are those traits that make them trustworthy? Is it um, the way that they speak or the way that they uh, move in their body? Is it the actions that they do um, or the words that they speak? And why do you listen to this person? Why do you listen to this person that you trust? Do you go to them for advice and heed their advice? Lastly, how do you incorporate their feedback into your daily life? So if this is someone you trust and you think about what makes them trustworthy and how you listen to them, if you're listening to them, how do you take on any of their feedback in your daily life? I want you to visualize this person in your mind the emotions you feel when you're around them and sort of maybe think about why you might feel those things. So if you want to, you can close your eyes if you're comfortable to do so and just visualize this trustworthy person and think about how you feel when you're around them. Physically, how do you feel? Emotionally, how do you feel? And why do you feel those things? I'm going to provide an example. So someone I trust very deeply um, is one of my mentors. Um, her name is Sorong Sworn. Um, she um, 
has been, I call her my nonprofit mama. And when I'm around her, I always want to give her a hug. That's the first, I'm not a hugger. <laughs> For folks who don't know me, I'm not a hugger, but she's one of those few people that I want to run up to and give her a hug. And she makes me feel safe. Um, and she is the type of person who I can go to if I'm ever having any like career or professional crisis. Um, everything's a crisis um, on my end. So she's someone who makes me feel calm. She, um, I can trust her to provide me with an honest answer. Um, and emotionally, she makes me happy. Um, she makes me happy because even if um, she gives me the hardest advice. I'm happy to know that this is what I need to hear. And then I can go ahead and take on her advice and slowly incorporate it into my daily life, knowing that it is a process. So that's someone for me. And I would love to hear from folks if um, one or two folks want to go ahead and unmute themselves and share um, just really quickly. You don't have to share their name like I did, but if it's someone that you trust, please let us know who it is and their, who it is in your life and why, what makes them trustworthy. And I will say if folks don't go ahead and unmute themselves, I will call on folks. So dun dun, beware. <laughs> All righty, I'm gonna call on someone. Um, just because it's the first person that I see on camera in my view. Um, is it Jason Nil Garcia? I'm so sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, please correct me. It's okay, yeah, it's Jason Hill. Um, so the person that I trust the most is uh, my mom. Why is she trustworthy? Because she's a good listener, listener and it's, she's not uh, judgmental. Um, why do I listen to her is because she's wise and she has more experience. So she always have great advice. And how do I incorporate her feedback? And in any situation, um, I, I just listen. And um, as an adult, I just, you know, wait, what is, um, what is she, what she telling me and what do I think? And obviously, um, most of the time she has, uh, she's right. So <laughs> I just tend to follow her, her direction more. Thank you for sharing. I'm just gonna give a couple more seconds. Does anyone else want to share? Alrighty, that's okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it moving, but don't worry. We will have other times to share. So what we're going to do is um, we're actually going to go into breakout rooms. So thank you for um, providing us with an example. But since sometimes it's hard to share in a big group, what we're going to do is we're going to go into a breakout room. I'm going to do three minutes total in these breakout rooms. You'll just be paired with random folks into these breakout rooms. And I want you to be able to share um, with the people in your breakout room. Um, share a story about who you trust and why. So as we demonstrated in these um, this large group share, please go ahead and just a short story, one, one minute per person, um, just to share about the person you trust and why you trust them. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and go into breakout rooms. Again, we're gonna do just about three minutes in the breakout rooms. And just give me one moment while I set that up. Stop sharing real quick. My breakout room is disappearing. <laughs> Jenny, as you said, you would think two years into the pandemic, we would have a little bit better control of Zoom. <laughs> All right. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna let Zoom be Zoom. <laughs> We're actually gonna skip the breakout rooms just to keep us on time. Um, 
So we will try breakout rooms again a little bit later, but we're just gonna keep it moving. So I asked folks to think about who they trust and why they trust that person, because we want to understand what a trusted messenger is. We want folks um, who are at our treatment sites. So the folks who are there in person meeting with our families and providing them services to understand who they are in this project. You are who we might consider um, a trusted messenger. And this might be at your workplace um, where you're working with folks in waiting spaces or it could be in your community. So this is a time when um, it could be anywhere if you're involved in um, your child's school, if you um, volunteer at your local parks and rec center, you might be a trusted messenger. So now what exactly is a trusted messenger? To put it simply, a trusted messenger is someone who is trusted by families and communities and they support families by delivering messages and tools on early brain and language development. So trusted messengers can be anyone, as I mentioned, a parent, a laundromat attendant, a doctor, um, a receptionist, a teacher, a cashier. You don't have to pass a test or become certified in any way to become a trusted messenger. Trusted messengers play a big role in the work that we Hello. do. Um, with Read by Fourth, which Hello? is small to fail um, here in Philadelphia. Hello. And trusted messengers are the ones who activate tools and um, resources that support and encourage families in their journey as, they're as they raise their children. It is important to note that you will not become a trusted messenger as a result of this training. Um, like I mentioned, there's no certificate or like special training you need. Um, instead, you are granted the privilege of being a trusted messenger when you establish trust with the families that you work with. So that's really important is that we cannot say that you are the trusted messengers. It's the communities and the families that you work with who can say that you're their trusted messengers. As your role in a trusted messenger, you're in a unique position. Trusted messengers play a large role in the communities that we work with. Your role is to share literacy messages and provide support and specific suggestions to families. So you let families know the power of their words and the interactions with their children. You're, you're the folks who enforce that parents and caregivers have the power to support their children's growing brain. Um, they can support um, building skills that will last a lifetime. You're the folks who remind them of their important role in their children's lives. And importantly, a trusted messenger's role is not to dictate, but to listen to families and understand their experience um, to better support them. So as a trusted messenger, you're not just there to stand on a soapbox and let folks know how important they are, but you're also there to listen to them and their needs. Sometimes if what we're doing isn't working, parents and caregivers will let us know, the kids will let us know, They'll look at a book and be like, Miss, I don't like this book. And we should hear them out about why they might not like a book in the space that we have. So it's really important to know that um, we are here as trusted messengers, again, to let families know the power of their words and their interactions and how that can benefit children for their lifetime. So why exactly are trusted messengers so important? So as you can see here um, in this little, um, there's a graphic, a photo here of a trusted messenger working with a group of children in one of our talk, read, sing spaces. Um, in these spaces, um, in a recent research evaluation of our work in laundry mats conducted by New York University, NYU, we found that trusted messengers can play a huge role in encouraging early learning. Uh, Too Small to Fail has, with Lakeshore Learning and Scholastic, created re um, family replay learn kits. And these are kits that are installed in spaces that can be added to waiting areas, right? So we're thinking about waiting rooms, um, at doctor's offices, um, wherever um, folks might be waiting um, in the spaces that they are. We have found that when there is a trusted messenger in these spaces, who are present, who can help activate the space. Someone like a librarian or a receptionist or a pediatrician or a nurse, 
um, that children and parents um, time spent in that space is increased. So folks are spending more time in those spaces, utilizing the tools and um, the strategies that are in those spaces. So the books are being read, the toys are being utilized. The average amount of time spent by children in the literacy space um, during um, times when a trusted messenger is there um, was 40, um, it was increased to about 47 minutes. So significantly more than what 29 minutes on average that a child spent alone in the space. So just thinking about how long folks are spending in those spaces, that increased amount of time where they're activated and they're engaging in the space is really truly making a difference. In a separate evaluation of our work with trusted messengers um, in the healthcare setting at the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, we found that when doctors provided families with both a tote bag filled with resources as well as messaging about the importance of talking, reading, and singing, it left a really big impact on families. Eight to 12 weeks after the families visited um, with the pediatrician, 99% of parents who participated in the follow-up interview said that they remember talking with their doctor about the importance of talking, reading, and singing with their child. And most importantly, 84% of those parents and caregivers reported that they noticed a change in their child's behavior since receiving the Talking is Teaching Toolkit from their trusted messenger such as their child talking more, being more interactive and engaging, and reading more. Throughout both of the mentioned evaluations, as well as through what we have learned through our community partners, we see that while resources and tools are great, it is the trusted messengers that make the biggest difference. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, when a parent, a doctor, a librarian, laundromat attendant, receptionist, nurse or cashier speaks with the family, it builds trust with them. Um, we're able to better understand families and support them. And that's truly where the magic happens. So again, um, we develop trust with families, not by inviting them into your world, but instead um, you develop a trust by getting into their world. One important thing, that's one important thing to remember is that we can't say we're the trusted messengers. That assignment is truly a privilege that is bestowed upon us by the community members that we work with, the families, caregivers, and children. So if you have pen and paper, if you're taking notes, uh, here's uh, three tips on building trust as trusted messengers. So while there are many ways to build trust with families here and there, here are three starter tips um, with ideas pulled both from education and social work fields. First, listen and ask questions. As you listen to the family's stories, ask clarifying questions. This shows the families that you are actively engaged in what they are saying. And remember that listening means letting go of everything you think you already know about the family you're working with. We're listening to understand. We all show up in meetings or new relationships with assumptions about the person we're meeting. Before you meet with a new family, practice letting go of those assumptions so you're available to listen with fresh ears. Second, empathize and understand. Every family is different and every family has a different story. Work to empathize with and understand the positions, stories, and barriers the families may be facing. Put yourself in the shoes of the family. Lastly, third, validate and encourage. After you listen to and empathize with family, a family, make sure to validate the work and effort they have put in. Let them know that all of their work so far has been integral to the development of their children and be sure to be friendly and authentic. As I mentioned earlier, authenticity, authenticity is key. So families will not want to open up to you if you are unwilling to be vulnerable and open yourself. Speak about your own experiences as a caregiver or parent and share both the struggles and joys of being that caregiver or being a parent. Every trusted messenger is different. We're not all the same, just as our families are not the same as they enter our spaces. And the time that um, 
trust the messengers have with families may vary. It might be just checking in right at the front desk, or it might be a while while they wait to um, enter their appointment. There may also be time to do all three of these tips um, while you're with the families, or there might just be time to do one of them. As long as you're implementing one of these tips, it really does make a difference. There is something that a trusted messenger can do in a short amount of time. A cashier or receptionist can say, I know how difficult it is um, with a toddler. You're doing a great job. A simple kind word like that, a validation of the parent's work and efforts really truly does mean a lot. So in the chat, just would love to hear from folks we are utilizing that chat function. When are there opportunities for families to talk, read and sing together every day? So where have you um, had a chance to talk, read or sing with a young person in your life, whether it's your own children, children of friends, I'd love to take a moment to think, to think about that. And we have some answers here as they come in. Please continue to share, thinking about opportunities for families to talk, read or sing together every day. Michael saying in the car after school, yes, absolutely. I used to love when my mom would put B101 on and I'd like shout the lyrics of different 80s soft rock tunes after school. That time is a great time. Bedtime stories or just um, reading those bedtime stories together. We listed some of our favorite books um, at the beginning of this training. While cooking dinner or just after dinner, absolutely. Giving instructions while you're cooking. If you have a little helper who's helping you maybe peel potatoes or helping you sort through um, the different vegetables that you have, that's a great time to talk them through, asking them questions like, what color is the broccoli? Or how many pieces of potatoes do you see in front of you are great tools. So as you can see, there are many ways to talk, read and sing every day. There this is just a little preview of one of our key messages. Everyday moments can be meaning, a meaningful learning opportunity. And again, we're talking about making those small moments big. So again, if you have your pen and paper and you're taking notes, here are some more tips for mess um, as messengers. <clears throat> Excuse me. As we think about messaging, um, a good place to start is with some helpful basics on how adults learn. So if we're providing messages about how important early um, childhood development is and how important brain development is for young children, we're not really talking to the children. We're going to be talking to their caregivers, the adults in their lives. So you all probably know some tips on how children learn best, but when you're interacting with a parent or caregiver, here are some tips on ways that you can best support them. Parents and caregivers learn best when their experiences and knowledge are recognized and built upon. So we are all experts in this room, as well as how our parents and our caregivers are experts um, in their own spaces. And the best that we can do is help them build upon what their, are, their expertise is. Parents and caregivers learn best when they are provided opportunities to practice new learning. So if we're sharing a new tool or anything like that, if we're giving suggestions, um, anyone learns best when they're able to practice those things. So not just parents um, and adults, but children too. Additionally, connections are made between theory and practice. So we're learning best when here's this idea so if I told someone, oh, the best way to help your child um, develop their reading and literacy skills is to talk, read, sing with them. And that's it. Like, that's all I say. You might just look at me and be like, great, noted. And it went from one ear straight out the other ear. But sometimes connections are me too. Saying things like, oh, like talking is a great way to help develop early um, learning skills those early uh, brain developments. So maybe when you're out and about with your kids and you're on the bus, you could ask them to count 
how many open seats do they see on the bus? Or you can ask them things like, what color do they see on the seat? So being able to um, make those connections between theory and practice. And lastly, parents and caregivers learn best when feedback is strength-based, reinforcing what someone is doing well. So reminding folks and validating folks on the skills that they already have or that they're currently developing and being able to acknowledge um, how far they've come. Click. <laughs> there we go. All righty, so some key messages um, for families. We're focused on delivering messages to parents on early brain and language development. From the Too Small to Fail perspective, here are some key points to touch on with families in the interactions that you might have with them. Again, if they're long interactions or short, maybe you can incorporate some of these things. So try to do one or more of the following with families. First, talking, reading, and singing every day from birth will help build a child's young brain, preparing them for kindergarten and beyond. We really emphasize the from birth section here. Even when infants cannot talk, they are still making connections around um, about the world and the sounds that are around them. Singing is also hugely beneficial and parents can naturally bring it into their everyday routine. Parents and caregivers all around the world have the instinct to sing to their baby in all sorts of ways. Parents can sing a calming lullaby song when they already, um, that they already know, or maybe even make up playful songs to um, different daily routines like washing your hands or getting dressed. I know uh, helping to raise my niece when she was little, she's 14 now, uh, but we have a bunch of those little goofy songs that we still remember about um, looking both ways and crossing the street and we're walking and walking and walking and just doing things like that. All of this helps children with um, phonological awareness as singing breaks down words into syllables. So just thinking about how, how these sounds feel in our mouth, what do they sound like? Reading also is hugely beneficial for young children. When caregivers read aloud, the action of snuggling up together and reading promotes physical contact and positive interaction. It can also help spark a child's imagination, build language and reading skills, motivate them to love books, and even increases their attention span and memory. So just thinking about how all of the benefits of reading um, that story time right at bedtime, or even maybe in the morning. So just um, reading aloud. So um, again, just trying to do one of the um, these things with our families, uh, just reminding them of the benefits. Um, here are some more um, key messages that we might share with parents. Parents can transform any moment into a meaningful learning opportunity, whether it's bedtime stories, crossing the street, or sitting down and waiting uh, to meet with their pediatrician. Excuse me. Um, I do have uh, my coffee cup <laughs> right next to me. And um, this is just a small object that provides a great opportunity for learning. I could ask a young person, what color is my coffee? Um, I could ask them, what does it smell like? When you touch it, what does it feel like? My cup is a little bit wet. It's cold. Um, so just thinking about all the different learning opportunities from just holding my coffee cup, looking at it, and just asking those types of questions. Uh, families don't need any extra time to do these types of things. It can be integrated into part of everyday life. Next, encourage bilingual or multilingualism. Children who learn more than one language have more active and flexible brains, and, are, um, and there are many other benefits as well. Many of the families that we work with, um, especially in Philadelphia, um, may be Spanish-speaking families, um, may also speak other language. I know myself, I'm bilingual. I speak both um, Cam um, Cambodian or Khmer and English fluently. Um, encourage folks to talk, read, sing in whatever language they feel comfortable with. I know that when I grew up, I spoke a lot of Cambodian because that's what my family was most comfortable with while I was growing up. So I knew a lot of those Cambodian uh, lullabies and songs. 
Um, things like picture walks where caregivers and children look through pictures in a book are also great for speakers of other languages to become comfortable with reading to their children when there are no books available in their home language. So if for any reason the books in your space don't necessarily reflect the languages that are in your space, you don't have to read word for word what's on the book. Just the act of opening it, looking at the images and asking those questions of what do you see in asking those questions in their own um, native language or home language, whatever language is comfortable for them, interacting with those books, um, even if it's not directly with what's written on there, but the images that are on there can really make a difference. And finally, it's important to acknowledge what families are already doing to support their child's early development. We are not here to fix something that's wrong. We are here to support families with tips, tools, resources, and encouragement. So as I mentioned, we're not just here to just dictate how to do things or what to do, but really just to encourage folks to interact with um, learning rich environments with our new spaces and to get them to be able to pick up a book or pick up a new book or just to talk a little bit more together, to sing a little bit more together. For our trusted messengers here in Philadelphia, especially our community-based um, organization staff, there are many ways for uh, community-based organization staff to support families as trusted messengers. You all might not have too much time with parents, caregivers, families, depending on how you are engaging with families. However, during the time that you spend with families, try to provide them with some encouragement model one or two tools um, you're distributing or some of the things, the tools and tips that we've provided today, even the messaging that we've provided. Try to share these uh, key messages in the time that you spend with the parent. As an example, um, here's an example of what a CBO staff did as a trusted messenger at the Van Buren County um, in Michigan. So during a community resource, um, a distribution event, staff provided materials like clothing or backpacks to families. If you're planning to engage with families in these shorter moments, where perhaps you don't have too much time to spend with them one-on-one -on -one to talk with them and learn their story, try to integrate, integrate encouragement into those interactions or at least one of the key messaging and, a modeling, and modeling one or two um, of the tools that we've talked about today. For example, while handing out um, a onesie or a backpack or any other kind of resource to a parent, you could say a fun tip for this item that you might find helpful is while you're um, reading through this brochure or postcard, talk about the fun colors that are all over the graphics. What are small, um, that small moment where you're engaging with your child in uh, going through these resources or um, anything like that can help provide, um, can help build your baby or your toddler's vocabulary and brain, and then provide validation and encouragement in a moment that feels um, that feels most natural. So again, just trying to get folks to understand how important these small moments are and how these small moments are really big moments for our young people and for our families. For our health center folks, for pediatricians, nurses, the staff that work at health centers, um, provide encouragement, model tools, um, and provide tips on early brain and language development. Share a few of the key messages. So as um, um, health workers, you hold a trusted position in your community, and you likely will have a bit more one-on-one -on -one time with families. During, the, um, during a wellness visit for a child, you can notice what the parents are already doing and provide some encouragement on what you see. You also have a great opportunity to share resources with families and caregivers and explain and model the tools that you provide. Excuse me. During a visit, uh, you can also provide some tips on early brain and language development. We encourage you to emphasize that those little moments of interaction, whether you're a pediatrician or um, otherwise, that those um, little moments of interaction between caregiver and child, like talking, reading, and singing, can play a big role in building a baby's brain. 
One example of pediatricians as trusted messengers in our talking is teaching community through Too Small to Fail is with trusted messengers at the Zuckerberg um, San Francisco General Hospital. Um, at the general hospital, pediatricians and nurse practitioners talked with um, parents and children ages zero to three years old about the importance of talking, reading, and singing with young children. They also provided a tote bag resources with a children's book, a CD with music, clothing, a baby blanket, and a few other materials. The pediatricians, excuse me, and nurse practitioners were encouraged to not only share how talking, reading, and singing builds the baby's brain, but also to model the tools in the tote bag. We received a testimonial from a parent who said, quote, my son's pediatrician did take time to, excuse me, did take the time to take everything out of the bag. And he told my son that it was for him. And he said, look, it brings a book for you to read with your mom, brings a CD to dance with your mom or your dad or your brothers and brings a blanket and a shirt. And in fact, the shirt um, was put on the boy at the time. So being able to not just hand over resources, but really engaging with folks and getting not just parents and caregivers, but the children to touch those resources as well to get involved in those things. So just in the chat, we'll love to know, um, how have you engaged with families previously as part of your everyday workflow? And what was that like? So we all have different roles in our communities and in our workplaces. And we'd just love to know in this space, just think about how have you engaged with families previously as part of your everyday workflow? Are you a caseworker who provides social services? Are you um, a healthcare worker who might be checking patients in for a healthcare visit? Are you a staff person at one of our emergency family shelters who's helping a family in crisis find um, a safe and warm place um, for the evening. So let us know. How have you engaged with families previously as part of your everyday workflow and what was it like? And again, we'd love to hear from you in the chat. If you feel so inclined to, please unmute yourself. We'd love to hear from one person if they'd like to let us know how they engage with families um, in their everyday workflow. So we have someone uh, who formerly worked in before and after um, school care and also as family caseworker. So definitely like really into um, the work and on the ground um, with children and families. I know for myself, I teach um, dance classes on the weekend. So I'm, I'm in the dance studio with children and families. Um, and we're not necessarily doing a bunch of read alouds, but we are doing a lot of movement based things that have a lot of language skills, like being able to tell a child to bring your foot behind you. It takes um, some motivation and just like interacting with children, um, both physically and verbally um, to get them to participate in dancing. And as we're moving along, just want you to think about how are you a trusted messenger in your everyday workflow? So who, like your position at your organization or agency, how can you be a trusted messenger? How can you share some of the messages that we have? How can you connect folk um, to reading captains with read by fourth? Or um, how can you encourage folks to volunteer with their children at their preschools or their aftercare? So just thinking again about how are you a trusted messenger? We're seeing that um, people occasionally bring their children with them when they come in for counseling and sometimes we'll have interaction with the kids that can usually be summed up by asking them about what game they're playing or telling them that they um, you like their shoes or their shirt. That's great. Being able to just provide a compliment, a kind word um, throughout the day. I know whenever I get a compliment, it makes my day. And I've um, given compliments to folks and seeing little kids being like, 
oh, you want to know about the game I'm playing on my mom's phone? Let me tell you about it. And they just like dive straight into all of the details. And sometimes my favorite interaction is that oversharing um, and just getting them to like talk with us. That's wonderful. Um, so just a tip, um, encourage caregivers um, to ask questions as they do read aloud in waiting spaces. So just another tip, um, I've said this already, so I'm being a little bit redundant, but um, just continuing to emphasize, like there are already these moments um, while we're doing read alouds and reading out loud to children is great, but also getting them to comprehend. So not just knowing how the letters put together make sounds, but also what do these words mean? Um, what is a cat, as Jenny went over? Um, if we can sound out the word cat, can we also define what it is? Um, just getting folks to understand that comprehension is a big part of literacy as well. I'm gonna share this video, a message of um, the impact of messaging and tools. We're here in San Francisco at San Francisco General uh, because this was one of our first hospital partners back in 2016. And we launched uh, with the pediatrics department uh, to equip the pediatricians, the pediatric nurses, the support staff with prompts to help encourage them, but also parents all to talk to the kids who were there. We see children 13 times over the course of one year. So we kind of felt, I think, like a natural partner. Part of this was education and messaging for providers to understand how can we start to talk about this within this context of a well child check that can be really meaningful for families. It also came hand in hand with materials. Every family that got the same early literacy anticipatory guidance would receive a tote bag that had similar messaging that said talk, read, sing, which is what also what families were hearing on the radio and at the playground. We're all in agreement that, you know, the early years of life are some of the most formative for children. And the more that we can do to provide families with information and education around how important they are in their children's lives is kind of what we all believe. And we're here today because we're now expanding this program to the youngest members of the San Francisco general patient population, uh, the newborns and their families. We know it is never too early to start reading, singing, and talking to our children. And so starting uh, later this month, uh, every family with their brand new babies will leave the hospital with our toolkits. Hopefully every child who is part of the San Francisco general community will have a better chance to grow up in a language rich environment. So that was just um, a look into the impact of trusted messengers, especially in a space like um, at a hospital. Um, so we're not all pediatricians. <laughs> we're not all going to be in this sort of setting. Um, and we all have different types of resources that we'll have in our spaces. And I just wanted to share how um, the impact of the change that it can make in just being um, able to share the messages and tools that we've shared with you today. Again, multiple spaces. This is a pilot project here in Philadelphia, so this is something new. We are looking to do spatial transformations. Again, we're looking to transform the spaces that you work at, those waiting areas in your workplaces, into learning-rich environments. Um, so we're looking at bringing in design based on community input um, from the folks who have frequented your places, as well as your input into how we can transform these spaces we're looking at things, um, not major renovations, so don't expect a huge renovation in a brand new um, waiting area, um, but we're looking at things um, that we can replicate. So we're looking at creating spaces where can we make it comfier for families and children to come in? Can we provide um, seating, um, bookshelves, books? Can we provide interactive, um, engaging toys that are in the spaces that also promote literacy? And how can we bring in different colors or different themes into these spaces that reflect the interests of the children that are in your spaces, but also that um, reflect the, the needs or the, um, the wants that parents have in those spaces. A lot of parents mention wanting words up in, their, in the waiting areas that say things like peace or reminding folks to smile and look for kindness and joy. What kind of messaging can we bring in? So 
Um, again, multiple spaces is going to be a project where we're transforming your waiting areas um, by bringing in installations of new furniture, uh, murals, artwork, posters, and resources into your spaces. This is going to happen. The design is hap um, the design process is happening over the next two weeks. And I'll be working with um, our partners and so probably the leads at your um, spaces um, in terms of finalizing the designs. And then you're gonna start seeing some deliveries of furniture and these um, design aspects come in and the installations will happen early to middle of May. So you're gonna see these transformations happen. Once it's done, we're hoping to do some unveiling events um, to invite Chelsea Clinton to maybe some of these unveiling events um, and our partners, um, Jenny from We Buy Forth, um, all the folks from Too Small to Fail, if we can, um, to have these unveiling events to share with community and let them know that these spaces are available for them. So we're looking at the next month, month and a half, being very busy um, with these transformations and just getting it launched um, into these spaces in Philadelphia. As a Philadelphian myself, born and raised, I'm really excited to see these things. My mom was a social worker, so I'm very familiar about um, community-based organizations and what it's like to just like sit and wait while like um, your caseworker is waiting for, um, is working with folks. And as a kid who's like sat in a bunch of waiting rooms or even at a health center and just like kicking my feet, um, bringing my own books, I can just imagine how exciting it'll be to have these resources um, be around the city and hopefully for these things to be um, cohesive around the messaging that we're seeing at the SEPTA stations with Read by Fourth has done, seeing these spaces connected with Reading Promise Week and all of the other partners and folks who are doing this type of work in the city. So this isn't just happening in silo. We are very committed to making sure that we're working with partners and we're being as um, cohesive and as possible with um, everything that's already happening here in Philadelphia. And that brings us to the end of our training today. Um, I'm going to open up the floor for questions. If anyone has any questions or concerns about the project, any of the messaging we have, anything that Jenny shared, if you have any questions or anything, please feel free to unmute yourself or add it to the chat. I'm going to mute myself for one um, solid minute to give you time to think and ask us questions. Alrighty, that was actually half a minute. A minute feels very long on Zoom when it's quiet. <laughs> um, if you do have any questions or anything like that, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, I'm gonna stay on for the next 15 minutes if anyone wants to chat one-on-one -on -one as folks are leaving. I'm also entering my email into the chat. So if you have any questions or anything, um, if you'd like to meet one-on-one -on -one for any reason, I'm more than happy to do that. Send me an email. Um, it's right in the chat. It's um, L and then my last name, Ongpa. It's A N G P as in Peter, A K at ClintonFoundation.org. Feel free to send me a message. Would love to hear from you, support you in any way. And even if you don't have any questions right now, but as the transformations happen, after the installations happen, if for any reason you have any questions from now until December, feel free to send me an email or message. I'm happy to chat with you. And I just wanna say, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. It really truly does make a difference, the work that you're doing, your day-to-day -day work, as well as um, your willingness to participate in this training and be a trusted messenger um, for this project. Um, I will be emailing folks um, a link with the survey. Um, it's a post survey just so that we can send you a training certificate. So if you would really like a training certificate for your own professional development, please make sure to take the survey. I'm also going to put it in the chat after I'm done screen sharing. Um, so we'll have a post training survey. If you really want that training certificate, make sure to fill that out. That's the only way I can get you um, that certificate. Um, and then you'll receive um, a training certificate at the end of this. So thank you again for the folks who were able to join us today. 
Again, if you have any questions, feel free to stay on the call or to um, send me an email. I'm more than happy to accommodate. And so thank you folks. Have a good one.